open up our minds to receive what it is you have for us today. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Are you still picking favorites? When I was growing up, I can distinctly remember how people, what we called in the country, in Tennessee, where my parents came from, relatives and neighbors alike, even strangers, I suppose, had no problem with picking favorites among the available children in their family and in their community. I was just talking about it the other day. It was almost normal for a parent or even a grandparent to make it widely known that this one or that one, this child or that child, was in fact their favorite child. Oftentimes it was the one that was most attractive to them or the one who showed the most promise. The one who might have been considered most likely to succeed. I'm wondering if any of you all yes. experienced that same thing. <laughs> Were you a favorite or not? <laughs> yes. Well, you know, no, that, this is no longer politically correct for parents to have favorite children. That old saying that says it's a poor frog that don't praise its own pond means you're supposed to like everybody, right? All of your children. It's no longer acceptable for a parent to say they prefer this child over that child or over the lot of the children because all of our children possess their own special gifts. But just because it's not politically correct or not acceptable now doesn't mean it doesn't still happen. Many people who are now adults have suffered because of distinctions made first in their family, then on their jobs, in society, and yes, even in church. Everywhere you turn, there is an in crowd and there's an out crowd. In the lunchroom at school, there were the hip girls, and then there were those who were deemed to be weird and deserving of bad treatment. Why in this age of bullying in our schools, but not just among our youth, even in professional football, on professional jobs, folks are being treated less than because they don't happen to fall into somebody's favorite column. And this just should not be. But you know, there is something to this notion of being the favorite of somebody. All of us want to belong and to feel that we are special to someone, that we are somebody's favorite. And the first place we experience that need is when we're a child growing up in our family, desperately needing our parents' approval and love. I can remember as if it were yesterday when I was younger hearing my father refer to me as his baby girl. And when he said that, I cannot adequately put into words how that made me feel. You see, my father in his younger years was not the most passionate man in terms of how he expressed his feelings to his children. He was solid. He was a loving man, but solid. And we knew he loved and cared for us, but he was a disciplinarian. And he didn't believe in parents getting too chummy with their children for fear we wouldn't respect his instruction and training. So when he referred to me as his baby girl, I really don't remember what else he said. I just remember hanging on to those words and the feeling that they gave me. They were a term, that was a term of endearment. I felt I had a special status. He had placed me in my own category and it made me feel so good. And I carried it with me for years to come. In fact, it's gained entry into this message, so I still carry it with me today. To feel special, to hold a special status in somebody's eyes that no one else holds is indeed something that we all crave for something we all desire. And we are learning from our scripture today that God desires that we do 
play favorites, but not in the way we sometimes do it in our daily lives. <laughs> in the text, we hear Paul saying, live in harmony with one another. In other words, get along with each other. Now, harmony is the coming together in joint agreement of two or more entities that produces a special and unmatchable outcome. I hear Paul saying, stop all of the bickering, all the complaining and the competing and destroying that is going on among you, even among those of you who are a part of the household of faith. Join together in unity, in harmony one with another. And he lets us know that living in harmony with one another is one of those desirable traits, the acceptable sacrifice that we all want to adopt as children of God. Remember, Paul has already called us to take the high road and to esteem others higher than we do ourselves so that we can all have or live at peace and in a place of equilibrium and relative calm with one another. Then he goes on to address specifically those things that can hinder our harmonious life with each other. And he raises that old word, that proverbial pride, being proud when it comes to relating to one another. He says, do not be proud. But instead, be willing to associate with people of low position. As we read this, we see that being proud obviously involves not associating with certain people. When we are proud, it seems that we somehow think we're higher, we think we're better or above others. Paul specifically speaks up for the people in the world, on our jobs, in our family, and in our church, who aren't deemed to be the best, or the most attractive, or the most popular, or the most prosperous. Paul is standing up for what we view as the little guy, the little man or the little woman, the one who gets left out and pushed back because they just don't seem to measure up to our level of interest or standards. He's speaking up for the ones, and it could be you and me, he speaks up for the ones he told us about back in 1 Corinthians 12 when he said, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, it says in verse 22, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. They're necessary. And the parts that we think are less honorable, he says we treat them with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there would be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. And remember those parts of our body, the parts of Christ's body that are unpresentable, are usually the parts that may have an issue, a sickness, a situation that renders us less than the full part that God made us to be. Paul reminds us again here in verse 16 of Romans 12 that we shall not, we cannot forget our place and our position in God's plan. And along with our position comes some natural responsibilities. And that includes not leaving anybody behind or anybody out, regardless of whether or not they are our favorite. Remember, Paul admonished us in verse 3 of this chapter not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And God also made it plain in Proverbs chapter 6 in those six, no seven things that God hates, those things that are detestable for him. He made it plain that God hates pride. God hates it when we are proud, when we think more highly of ourselves than of others, including our family. 
family and our friends and even our fellow church members. When we place some folks, including ourselves, high and dismiss other folks as low. <clears throat> Again, God is looking out for the little guy by the world's standards. And God is leveling out the playing field in his kingdom business. And God is instructing us to reach out beyond our comfort zone, beyond our warm market, beyond those who we already love and care for, and spread some love and attention to someone who you may think or who society has deemed to be less than favored. To reach out to those who aren't from our community or our family, and who may do things a bit differently than we do. Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 25 that as much as you have done unto the least of these, my brothers, you've done it also unto me. And he also said to the disciples, and he is saying to us today, if you love me, then feed my sheep. Feed those literally and figuratively who are hungry, whether they are hungry for food, attention, love, of belonging yes, yes, yes. just to become an important part of God's family. <laughs> and as an aside, but just as important, be careful. Be care we as Christians, we have to be careful when we find ourselves referring to new members in the church or newly baptized Christians when we find ourselves calling them babes in Christ. Because when we do, we can slip into a thinking that says that somehow, since we've been here a little longer, we're somehow higher <laughs> or further along than these young people in the Lord. Remember, Jesus said, unless you come to me as a little child, innocent and pure, as a babe in Christ, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I'm also reminded of that old slave song that said, everybody talking about heaven ain't going. <laughs> Paul says in verse 16 that one of the ways we can live in harmony with one another as a member of the unified body of Christ, as a necessary part of our Christian commitment of love, faith, and unity, is to associate, to spend time with, to open ourselves up to those who we might deem as less than we are because of the world's ranking of all of us. God keeps mentioning his hatred of pride because God knows that the moment we think we're better than somebody else, better than another one of his children, that is the precise moment that we die to God. You see, God cannot use us when we are stuck ourselves and separated from other vital parts of his body. Remember, we're all necessary to the body. I don't think we realize that when we get mad at people in the church or at how things are going in the church and we stop making ourselves available to God to be used in God's service, we don't realize that we are really hurting ourselves because we are merely cutting off our link to God and not God's link to his church. God will use God's church whether we in or out. He will use his community of believers to accomplish his purpose in the world, but we decide whether we're going to be a part of what God is doing. Remember, God promised never to leave us or forsake us, but have we made that same promise to God? Have we committed our lives to God such that even when our flesh wants to flee, we cannot go? Because our love and devotion for God is so complete and is so strong that we cannot leave the place that he has assigned us to be. Oh, God knows that pride destroys pure and authentic love, especially the love we can have for our brother and our sister. Pride destroys clean hands and pure hearts. And pride always, the Bible says, precedes or comes before a fall. Paul says live in harmony, live at peace, 
and in a proper relationship with one another by laying down your pride and picking up a new way of relating to people, especially to those you might deem to be the unpresentables among us. And never forget, do not forget that we all have been, are now, or have the potential to be the unpresentable ones in the body of Christ at any given point in our walk. And what good news it is to know that the other members of our Christian family will have our back when we need them most. <laughs> Not only does Paul say don't be proud, get rid of that despicable and destructive demon called pride, but he also says as a companion, get rid of the conceit. Do not be conceited, which is a partner of pride. When I think of conceit, I'm reminded of the no in the air kind of existence we can have where no matter how jacked up our life is and no matter how unreal our beliefs are about ourselves, and maybe even about our family or our friends we will stick our nose up in the air and act like we're better than we are stuff is falling down all around us we are lying and cheating that all Christians be humble before the Lord yes. and before his people. Conceit is what I like to call the raggedy version of pride. At least with pride, there is usually some basis for why we think we're better than somebody else. It's all sick, but still, there's usually some basis. But with conceit, it often has no basis at all. It is grounded in someone's stubborn, stubborn belief that they are better even when there is no reality in fact. Now to be sure, when you are confident in your own skin and competent in your ability, some folk will call you conceited. And even when you refuse to participate in mess and activity which is aimed to destroy another person, you will be accused of trying to be above everybody else. But these don't qualify as characteristics of the demon of conceit that Paul is talking about. Conceit is form, F-O-R-M, masquerading or pretending to be substance. Acting like you're something that you, in reality you're not. Conceit is a sense of value about yourself that far surpasses what is healthy and true. Conceit is another form of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought with a total lack of sober judgment that Paul talk about and the faith that God has given to us. Conceit is the same as being intoxicated or being drunk on ourselves and ignoring the most important things that are right in front of us because of our impaired judgment. Paul said, says straight up, don't be conceited. Root out that demon from your hearts and your minds. As a submitted ambassador for Christ, there is no room for conceit and pride. No room for self-centeredness because it destroys the unity that must be present in the body of Christ. And this is not just directed at us thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. It's also directed at us esteeming others more highly than we ought placing others on unrealistic pedestals that in time we begin to try and tear them down from. God wants us all on solid level ground, operating with a kingdom mentality that says, without God, I can do nothing. Without God, my life would fail. How do you see yourself? How do you see others? Are you still playing favorites? Do you have those who you prefer and those who you don't? Do you think somehow you're better than those people or than the other? The other, those people who are different from you? We all need to examine ourselves and seek forgiveness from God in those areas in which we have elevated ourselves above others. 
I'm reminded of the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. We looked at it a while back in Luke 18, where both of these men went to the temple to pray, but they approached God in very different ways. I can see the Pharisee, he was the religious man, walking boldly up into the pulpit of the temple to the front of the church, taking a hold of the mic and without even barely closing his eyes, throwing his head back with total confidence and self-satisfaction, saying before God, God, I thank you that I am not like these men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even, God, I thank you that I'm not like this old tax collector. He said, I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. But he never once acknowledged who God was in his life. While in contrast, the tax collector, the publican, one of the outcasts of society, because he was affiliated with the Roman government, I see him peeking in through the back door of the church making sure it's safe for him to go in, making sure not many people were inside, fearing the jeers and the ridicule from those even inside the temple who hated him, but still needing to get an audience with the Almighty God. I see him with no microphone in his hand, with his head held low, the scripture says, his voice was probably just above a whisper. Maybe he was even trembling, but I hear him begin to cry out to God, God have mercy on me, yeah. a sinner, yeah. as he beat his breast signaling his humility before God and his recognition of his own sin. Yeah. Which one of these do you think God favors the most? Which one of these does God hear and answer? Jesus says in this parable, I tell you this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts or lifts himself up shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Brothers and sisters, we are called today to, in the, the current vernacular, check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Mm -hmm. It is so easy to fall into the trap of placing yourself above others. But when we do, we are outside of the will of God and we need to quickly repent, turn away from our wicked ways, turn back to God and then assume our rightful position of humility and love for one another. I often tell the story when my mom died, it wasn't until after then when all of the siblings, all five of us were talking to each other that we found out that she made each one of us believe we were her favorite. <laughs> we didn't find it out till she was gone. I was sure I was her favorite. <laughs> So it's okay to have favorites, but those favorites better be anybody and everybody God places in our path and calls us to minister his love, grace, and mercy to. We better learn how to make everybody our favorite and find out how we can touch God's heart as we all God's favorites live in harmony, one with another. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah.